It's unique to me right now is if you've been kind of looking at the newspaper and you're seeing kind of a little bit of a pushback, just a slight, but a pushback against Russell Wilson, who was a phenomenal quarterback for the Seahawks, but a Hall of Fame type guy. I mean, he's not just like a good quarterback. He's won the Super Bowl. I mean, he's a Hall of Fame type guy, quarterback. And uh, he's getting a little bit of a push that, you know, because they're, they're, what, three and six or whatever their, their record is this year, or three and eight or four and eight or whatever. Uh, and it just doesn't look like they're going to get in the playoffs and there's push and he's game. And they forget that this guy just had an injury that you don't really come back from in the short time that he came back from it. But he just kind of pushed through it. And so... Uh, in one of the articles that came on the Seattle paper, it says, and Russell Wilson was talking about it, and he says, my body of evidence uh, testifies that I am an overcomer. And so I'm, I'm officially welcoming Russell into the house. You are an overcomer, Russell. And when God measures your body of evidence, he's going to find it the same as Russell's. You're an overcomer. And that you've overcome the challenges of life and you will continue to overcome. Because it's not one incident. It's not a one-day event. It's a life habit. Every month, at the beginning of, at the end of last year, we built the themes for this year. And today's theme is... In a great house, there are great people. Great people are in a great house. God is the great God, and, and his house is a great house. Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many great houses. He calls it mansions. There's many great houses in my Father's house. So we are the people of God, and God has designed us to do great things as his people. So when you look at the scriptures, you'll find uh, a mix of people. Some people that have done extraordinary things established by God and some that have not. Uh, king David was a great king of Israel and a powerful king and a great leader. And uh, people talk about David in Israel and city of David, Jerusalem, and all the wonderful things that David has accomplished as a king. They don't speak too much about some of the other kings that were not as good. Um, Jezebel, who was a queen in, is, is, you probably don't name your kid Jezebel. Jezebel, be just like her. I mean, she was a, just an awful king. Her husband, who was he? Ahab. And he wasn't a great king. He was influenced a lot by her, but he just didn't have the, the metal to be a great king. Um. Both of them have left the planet. All of those have left the planet. David has gone into a place of honor, and the other two, not so much. I just want us to be, at the end of the time that we run our course, to be, great, be marked as great people in the kingdom of God. Daniel's a great man, powerful man. Esther, great woman, powerful woman. Be an orphan, and then she becomes the queen. And then she saves Israel and steps into an environment where she petitions and stands in the gap for her. And, and, and she's a little afraid to do it early. And her, her uncle Mordecai says, are you kidding me? You're the queen. This is why God made you the queen for such a time as this. And if you're silent now, we will get deliverance from some other place because we are designed to overcome. But it's been designed to be through you to make your name great. You're one of the great people in the earth that's ever walked with God. Come on, girl. And then she goes, okay. Everybody praying fast with me. No food, no water. For three days. On the fourth day, I'm going to see the king. And if I perish, I perish. Now, you know how tough that is? I'm a fasting machine. I love to fast. I'll fast, I'll pray. But no food, no water. For three days. It's different. I mean, she got on the fast track right into the presence of the king. 
So by the time when the king sees her, he goes, whatever you want. She hadn't even opened her mouth to ask for anything yet. He sees her and immediately the anointing of God that's in her from her devotion to God is expressed in his heart. And he says, here's the king. Whatever you want, whatever you want. She says, I wouldn't even bother you with this. And her enemy is right in the same room. And the thing flips in five minutes. This is the whole nation at stake. And it flips in her hand in five minutes. May God make you one of the great people in the kingdom. Do extraordinary things for you. You're the right, you're the right person at the right time in the right environment. And even though sometimes it's a little bit of a push up the hill and you can feel a little discouraged or down, it's unwarranted. It's unwarranted for you to be down. It's unwarranted for you to look at any challenge and any struggle, anything, feeling like you're not going to overcome it. You've already overcome it. You just don't know how all the time. And you have to let some of these things just kind of play its way out. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. He didn't send him till there was a time appointed. And there's a time appointed for your victory. And there's a time appointed for you to overcome. There's a time appointed for healing in your house. And there's a time appointed for restoration. Come on. There's a time appointed for provision, stupid money, crazy things that you've never had before. There's a time appointed. Let that God work those things out for good. Somebody would say, well, you know, they died without it. Died? How has that happened? Because they exited the earth suit, you think that's it? You think my dad, who I never saw, I will not see him? I will absolutely see him. Why? When? At the time appointed. When I step into the kingdom of God, and my dad will be there waiting for me. My mom will be there as well. It's a time appointed. It's not an, it's not an end that it, there's an end that ends in defeat. The end always ends in victory. You have a victory coming in the Lord. That's powerful victory. No limits. We live by no limits. In a great house, there are great people. Turn with me to Psalms 15. Psalm, this psalm is a powerful psalm. David is a great um, prospector. He sees the things that God sees. Psalms 15.1, it says, Lord, who can dwell in your tent? Who can dwell in the tent? is like a house, a dwelling place. Who can dwell in your, in your dwelling place, your tent, your house? Who can live on your holy mountain? The mountain represents kingdoms. Who can not only, who can live in your house and dwell in your neighborhood? The mountain's kingdoms it's looking like apply to your life. Who can live in your presence, in your house, and live in your neighborhood? Can you imagine living in God's neighborhood? Who lives there in that big old house? Well, that's God's. It's God's house. I'm going to go visit him then. I'm in his neighborhood. I'm going to go say hello to him and bring him a gift and, and see what's going on. Does he got a pool over there and a hot tub? You're visiting God's place. You know, I bet he does. Streets of gold. Unbelievable place. It's going to mess you up to be in the presence of God. So the question you could typically ask, the answer to that, who can dwell in your, in your house and, and, and live in your neighborhood? No one. But that's not what he says. God gives us the ability to step into his atmosphere and be like him. The one who lives blamelessly, practices righteousness, and acknowledges the truth in his heart. Let's, let's park for a second and look at those three. Lives blamelessly, practices righteousness, and acknowledges 
truth in his heart. Um, the word blameless means to be innocent or wholesome. It's a lifestyle. It's a life habit. Just a life habit. Now, America, when you're kind of judging America, there, 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 was, a, there was a time we, we did better and lived better and lived a holier life and a more faithful life than we, than we are as a nation right now. Um, doesn't mean the nation's bad. just means the nation's going through a season, a struggle, challenges. The one who lives blamelessly, innocent and wholesome. May, may, make it a life habit that some of the things that are in your personal life are good things. So that you don't have to try to turn it off. You ever, you ever go in your kid's room and then they, they switch the channel real quick or uh, look to something else? And he's like, what are you doing? Nothing. You know they're doing something they don't have no business doing. Or, because they switch it real quick. And sometimes, as humans, I think we'll switch something real quick before God, and he's like, I already know. There's nothing hidden from me. There's no thoughts you have in your heart that are hidden from God. No, no disappointments. No struggles. No stuff like, oh, no, good. And then your wife comes in and says, hey, how's it going? You're like, fine. You know, God already knows. So make, make a decision just to live blamelessly, innocent and wholesome. I'm just going to be innocent and wholesome. Now, listen, it's hard for you as a human to just mandate that to be, and it is. So you need help. So you, the helper, the, the comforter, the Holy Spirit is the helper. He will help you live blamelessly. But you have to want to do that. He's not going to force that. You don't give reward when you forced it, you give reward when the person has come voluntarily. Practices righteousness. Practices doing the right thing. It takes practice to do the right thing. You're not just going to do the right thing always, all the time. But practice. If you make a mistake, own up to it. We are in the house of God. We're in, the, in his tent. We're in, living in his neighborhood. So if I make some mistakes, I'm just going to go to the throne and say, hey, my bad. I'm going to confess it. I'm going to get it out. Here's one thing about me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell everything. I just made a decision a long time ago I wasn't going to have secrets. Plus, it's easier on my memory. Because if I have secrets and stuff, then I got to remember the lie that I told to cover up the secret and make sure that's congruent next time when I'm changing the story I don't really remember. I just might as well just live in the truth. It's much simpler, much easier. Problem with living in the truth is when you do stupid stuff and people say, hey, what did you do yesterday? You can't say nothing. What did you do? Nothing. Really? I thought I saw you at so-and-so. Was that you there? No. No. How close were you when you... <laughs> just live by the truth. Sometimes it's embarrassing to live by the truth. But I'm telling you, you'll get tired of the embarrassment. Practice righteousness. Practice doing the right thing. Um, it's costly, though. Pra live blamelessly. Practice righteousness. And acknowledges the truth in his heart. Accept, admit, and submit to the truth. I'm going to do what God asked me to do. And if I can't do it, I'm going to ask him to empower me so I can do it. If, I don't, if I'm stingy and I don't want to give, I'm asking him to give me a heart to give. If, I'm, if I lie all the time, I'm going to ask him to give me a heart of truth. I'm not going to be a liar. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm antagonistic, I'm going to ask me to make me a sweet person, a kind person. One of the things growing up, I had... I had a bit of a conflict for me as an athlete because as an athlete you wanted, especially in football, you're, you're a tough guy. You wanted, that's, that's in my mind. It was, you had to be a tough guy. You had to be tough and strong and don't take, you know, f no friends and pop things around and get there. You never, you know, you crush you. You know, that was my deal of being an athlete. Of being skill level was not 
what really t- was talked about. It was like toughness and strong. So I got that, right? Then I'm, but it had a bit of a dichotomy with my relationship with God. I mean, I was supposed to be nice to these people, but, but I really wasn't. So, and so I had, to, I had to try to separate the game from the life. And it was tough. Then it was tough. I, I step on the field and, you know, I was fast and strong, but I wasn't, I wasn't the biggest guy there. And, but I talk, I got an edge. I would talk. I could talk. So I'd get in a guy's head. I mean, I would be in his head and like after like 10 minutes into the game. I'd, I'm talking trash. I'd done some study. I, you know, I know where he went to school and what he graduated in from. I'm like, hey, you know, you didn't, you know, I went to Stanford, you know. I'm going to say it slow so you understand. Stanford. <laughs> Oh, man. So now you got, you got a guy who's your opponent who thrives on excellence. And I'm the best, the strongest. And now you're getting his head. And once you could tell what you got in a guy's head. And so the Lord will start telling me, stop it. Stop doing that. I didn't create you and give you a voice that penetrates heart for you to do that. I'm just telling you what, there's, there's practices that we built up that are not godly. It doesn't mean we're evil, wicked people. We're not. We, we, but we can't practice those things and, then, and make like those things are going to be dissolved when we get measured in the kingdom. So he tells us now so we can clean some of that up. Because in his house, there are great people. Who does not slander with his tongue who does not harm his friend, verse 3, or discredit his neighbor. Clean language. Clean, wholesome language in what we're doing. Um, And we're honorable to those around us, to our friends and neighbors. They're different. Sometimes your friends are your neighbors, but, but not always. So often my neighbors are just people that live in my community that I like and they like me, but we don't know each other real well. They don't spend a bunch of time at my house, nor do I at theirs. But I do with my friends. Who despises the one rejected by the Lord, but honors those who fear the Lord. Now listen, that's an important component there. Because there's some things that God just doesn't like. And if you're in a place where you're embracing the things that God hates, it's going to be difficult for you to build intimacy with him. I think a little bit as a nation, we have, we have drifted a little bit back into a place where we've accepted things that God doesn't accept. And I'm just, I can't control the America, but I, but I can't control Gordon. So I'm not going to allow myself to make in my, in my tent, in my house, in my heart, the things that God doesn't love and appreciate. And you might, you might live in a culture that accepts that, but it, I don't accept that in my culture, in my heart. I might, I might be in a nation that accepts certain things that I think are, that are perverse and ungodly that God doesn't accept. But I'm not going to be part of the culture that accepts it. I'm going to have a voice that doesn't accept that. I'm just saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm, just, I'm not going to embrace things that God doesn't embrace or, or stand against things that God, that, God, that, God, that God does embrace. Hmm. Honor those that, honor, that God honors and reject the things that God rejects. And then sometimes you don't really even know which one it is, so you have to ask, Father, what, what's good and what, sh- what don't you like about this? What's going on? And how should I practice that? And what, what's the way I should go? And, and how, do, how do I serve you more effectively in that environment? And as you ask that, he will give you rewards. He will give you um, answers and keys if you ask that about how to get along with the people at your workplace, he'll give you that answer. If he tells you how to impact your community, he'll give you that answer. 
He'll tell you how to, how to make your marriage and your relationship stronger and how to be a better father or a mother towards your children. He'll give you that answer. It's not a time that God's just going to be silent to you. He'll show you the way if you have a heart to go that way. And if you'll honor the ones that God honors, you will overcome. Who doesn't, verse 5, who does not lend his silver at interest or take a bribe against the innocent. The one who does these things will never be shaken. Let me, let's read that again. Does not lend his money at, at, or his silver at interest. In other words, it's not, it's not against the interest. It's against the usury. It's, it's against taking advantage of somebody who's in a compromising environment and then you know that they're in a compromising environment and you, and you as a believer take advantage of them. So this thing that was really a dollar is now $20 because they have to have it and, they, and, and there's no other option. So you, so you abuse it. You take advantage of it. It's just, it's just ridiculous. It's, but it's the, it's the way the world runs. Supply and demand. If it's a slow a low supply, high demand, and all of a sudden the same product now is three times as much, five times as much. It was like remember when COVID came and people were, well, you had, a, you had a mask, and the masks were like ridiculously expensive to get a mask. You know, are you kidding me? These people need masks, and now because they need them and they're short supply, the price has gone up through the roof. It's just wrong, but that's the system of America. But it's not the kingdom. And you can live so much in a bad system that you start thinking that system is the system of the kingdom of God. It's not that system. God is a loving God. He's a merciful God. And he's a just God. And he'll give you almost everything, if not everything, for free. It's not our system. It's pay me. You owe me. I'm do this. Sometimes you can take that perspective into your personal life. And when things are not particularly good for you in a certain season, you're angry with God, angry with your family, angry with friends, thinking the world has owed you and they gypped you and they did you wrong. It's no good. Listen, you are a dead person. God released you from your sin and sent Jesus to die in your place. And you're now making a demand uh, at the grocery store? Because we just lose perspective. But I'm just saying, if you want to get into the tent of God and live in it and be cool in his neighborhood, it just, it just takes some behavioral shifts. Because, I don't, listen to me, I don't, I don't want the behavioral shift to come when you, when you get to heaven. When I get to heaven... Oh, everything will be good. When you get to heaven, there's, the first thing he does is measure you. He open up the books. And the first book is the book of life. Are you in the book of life? Oh, yeah, you're here. Good. Good. Welcome. Come on in. Let me give us another. Let me, give, let, me look at the, let me look at your book. The book that has your name, chapter 7. Let's see. And he starts reading your story. It's his story that he lived through you. And in the book, I don't think there's a bunch of things about what you did wrong. Yeshua has wiped those. In your book ought to be a book filled with a bunch of things that you did right. And all the times that you honored and all the times that you sacrificed and all the times that you gave and all the times that you really were, could have struggled and you were, but you didn't, that you, that you turned and you did it his way. I just, think, I just think sometimes people are going to come in, in the presence of God and, and they have these books and some are going to have booklets. You know the difference between a book and a booklet? A booklet is a booklet's just some little, little pamphlet. It's be a quick story. Oh, come on in. Welcome. Yay. Celebrate. Oh, man. I want, I want to tell you all the wonderful things you did. Okay, we're done. I've only been here eight seconds, so yeah, I know. 
Let us have, let him spend his time. Start on a Tuesday and speak about you for months. Because in a great house, there are great people. When you read the scriptures, a lot of the scriptures are the stories of God's interaction in the lives of, of people. Great stories. Powerful things. May our stories be those stories. Here's what the Lord says. The one who does these things, verse 5, will never be shaken. Never be shaken. Will never be shaken. I'll never be shaken. You need to say that to your, about yourself. I'll never be shaken. I'm going to walk with God and I'll never be shaken. It means there's going to be things that come against me, but I'm not shaken. I'm an overcomer. Not afraid of any of that. I walk with God. Well, there's a disease in your kids. I got a healing. But I'm not locked into this earth suit experience as a whole definition of how the greatness of God. He's greater than what I'm currently experiencing. And I'm going to have greater experiences. There was a Psalms 24, David. A similar. And I'm just going to read that one and, and close with that. Psalms 24, 1 says, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. There's nothing that I'll ever encounter that, that does not belong to God. God has already controls everything. There's no issue, no challenges, no struggle, no company, no currency, no nation, no season, no time that God has not already mastered. There's no place you're ever going to be, no airplane you're ever on, no nation that you're not ever in that does not belong to God. It's always his. He's at every moment of every second of my experience forever. So I, I don't need to be afraid or angry or disappointed or struck or, or f dysfunctional because God's in charge of everything all the time. It's a mindset. When you get that mindset, it'll settle you down. I've been on planes that have been, been shaky and struggling, and it's real quiet on the plane. And when, you get, when you get on a plane and everybody goes quiet on you, it's because they are not sure what's next. And they've gone to their outer limits type of movie show where, oh, my God, he's in a plane. I remember when I was a kid, Alfred Hitchcock. And you're, and you're going back to that movie as though you're living that right now. But you have God in that plane. I start realizing as long as I'm on the plane, I'm good because I have destiny and purpose. And everybody else is with me. So I would say to the Lord, oh, people were good. And when I was, when I was, when the, we, I was on planes that, that uh, were kind of scary, I had to check myself because I was a little scared myself. There's not a moment that sometimes I'm on a plane or I'm in, a, in a, an environment that's risky and, and I don't have to do some, hey, let me remind you, Gordon, who you are. Shut up, fear. I'm reminding me who me is. Somebody have to do those because we're human. For he laid its foundation, verse 2, on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain, the kingdom of the Lord? Who can be, who may stand in his holy presence? And the easy answer is no one. Oh, God, it's so wonderful. There's no one. No, it's not the right answer. It's not the, the answer is there is some qualifications for us to be in the presence of God all the time and for him to be in our presence all the time so that you're never alone and you always overcome and you always prevail. And it's not like that guy, she's so lucky or she is so fortunate. No, she walks with God. And a relationship with him is available to you, heathen. Heathen of life, come on. I'm going to pull you into the family of God. I'm going to show you how sweet it is and how wonderful this relationship with the king is. And it'll change everything for you. And you'll sleep peacefully at night. And everything will be abundantly provided. Abundantly provided. Well, I have nothing. I understand that. 
But God has decided to give you abundance. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false, and who has not sworn, lied deceitfully, lied about things that you know are true and you lie. Or you tell a lie as though it's the truth. The one who has clean hands, a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully, he will receive or she will receive the blessing, the favor from the Lord and righteousness, right standing with a, from the God of his salvation. Let me park just for a half a second. I'm running out of time. I want you to understand how important that is because sometimes as believers, you get to a place where you do something that you shouldn't have done and then you wonder whether you're even saved. Am I okay with God? I made a mistake. I don't know if, I'm, if I would die. I don't know. I'm so afraid because I, did, I shouldn't have said that, but I stop it. Stop that. That doesn't matter at all to God. You make some bad decision, some knucklehead stuff that you, that you shouldn't have done, and now that, that one moment's now defining your whole life. It's not defining your life. It's a bad decision. You, you shouldn't have done it. Repent from it and move on. Let it go. It doesn't define you. It doesn't track you. Well, you know, when I was seven years old, I, but I, stop it. You can't go back and retract every mistake you've ever made as though God is recording those things. He did not record those. Yeshua washed them away. It's religion that holds you in this bondage that, that you can never effectively fulfill. If I could do it on my own, I wouldn't need Jesus. I don't need you, Jesus. Chill out for a second. Get some of these other heathens in. I am so holy that I could stand in the presence of King, of the, of the great God of heaven and earth. I can't. I needed Jesus too. Scripture says he will receive, verse 5, the blessing from the Lord, favor from God. And righteousness, right standing from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Now listen, Selah, the word Selah, think about it, consider it, muse on it. Get in pursuit. Here's my call to you. Get in pursuit and restructure anything in your life that does not heighten or draw or intensify the presence of God in your world. I don't control your Metron. You control your Metron. Build what's in your Metron, the things that establish it, so that can, you can build that in your children and in your children's children and your family and all those things around you will be strong and powerful and mighty as you develop that. And you become the great, great people, a great person in a great house. You build a great house and you're a great person in a great house so that when God comes by, he wants to be in your house. I love this house. I love being here. These are my people, my friends. And that blessing comes and lives in your house and lives with your children and lives with your future and provides for you. And then when there's a need, you can call on God and he's quickly, he quickly responds to whatever you need, even before you ask. God is there performing it and doing things for you. But it's not about what he does. It's about empowering you to be the difference maker in the lives of those all around you and drawing them into the kingdom. Father, help us to live the way you've designed for us to live. Holy and acceptable and faithful and righteous. Empower us by your spirit. Do extraordinary things, God. You're the extraordinary God doing extraordinary things. Do extraordinary things in the, the lives of us, your sons and daughters, all of us individually and all of us collectively, so that at the end of time, when you're opening the books of life and our, our book, 
that we've come to realize that in a great house, there are great people, and we are one of the great people that have lived throughout time honoring you and blessing you and strengthening you. Help us, Father, to be stronger than ever before and more faithful than we've ever been. If you haven't given your life, that's how it starts. Jesus, come into my life. I accept you as the Lord of my life. Forgive me for my sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. Take every record that's against me and wash those records. Change them. Give me a record of righteousness. I'm in hot pursuit of the blessing of God. And I will not come into your presence alone. I'm going to bring a multitude with me. Help me by your spirit to be faithful in ways that I have not been faithful before. So lives will be changed. And let those things be sealed and settled. In Jesus' name.